and say it's enough. Thank God it's Friday. Yes, uh, this is the end of a five-day run. Uh, but of course, just for this week, because we'll start again next week. Uh, but let's do Friday business here on Business Morning on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. We'd like to start with oil prices, because that's global. It climbed on Friday on bets that OPEC Plus will discuss output cuts at a meeting that they're to hold on Monday, the affairs of China's COVID-19 curbs and weak global growth continues to limit gains and a potential cap on the price of Russian exports loomed. Brent crude features rose by $1.23 to $93.59 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude advanced $1.25 to $87.86. A barrel. Both benchmark contracts slid 3% in the previous session. The two-week lows, Brent was headed for a weekly drop of nearly 7%, and WTI was on track to fall about 5% for the week. OPEC Plus is to meet on Monday. That's the 5th of September, against a backdrop of sliding prices and falling demand. Even as top producer Saudi Arabia says that supply remains tight. Analysts expect the group to leave output targets unchanged. Their own numbers show a tighter than expected market and they would probably also want some more clarity on Iranian supply before making any big change to output policy. Meanwhile, investors remain worried about the impact of the latest COVID-19 curbs in China. Well, from there, let's go to the grains market, a cargo vessel carrying more than 3,000 tons of corn from Ukraine drifted aground in Istanbul on Thursday. That's yesterday halting shipping on Turkey's strait in the first of such incidents since a United Nations brokered export deal in July. The Istanbul governor's office and shipping firm said that 173 meter Lady Zema was safely grounded and anchored after a road of failure. Ukraine's grain export slumped after Russia invaded the country on the 24th of February and blockaded its Black Sea ports, driving up global food prices and prompting fears of shortages in Africa and the Middle East. Three ports were unblocked under the deal signed on the 22nd of July by Moscow and Kyiv and brokered by the UN and Turkey. Well, let's come to Nigeria now and uh, see the PMI growth in Nigeria's private sector activity eased in August from what was recorded in July. And that's according to the Purchasing Managers Index from one of uh, Nigeria's leading financial institutions, Stanbic IPTC Bank. In a statement released for the month, the lender says that the headline PMI for business conditions in the industry stood at 523 last month compared to 53.2 in July. At the same time, overall input price inflation rose as the second fastest rate on record while sentiment moderated to its weaker since November last year. Among the four monitored subsectors, uh, three registered output growth with agriculture as top in the rankings, followed by wholesale and retail services. On the other hand, Manufacturers recorded a fall in output levels in August. Further analysis of the PMI report shows that new orders rose for the 26th month running in August, with panelists linked to general improvement in customer demand. Well, uh, we've been talking to Chris Lems, who is a correspondent outside the shores of Nigeria in the Caribbean, now uh, covering the Africans and Caribbeans uh, summit. And uh, he sends in this report to tell us that uh, there are lots of conversations there. And one of some of the areas that are being uh, considered a business relationship between both regions, that's Africa and the Caribbean. And uh, this is part of the submission by speakers at the inaugural edition of the event, which is organized by Afrex in Bank. Welcome to the Lord Erskine Sandy Ford Center in Bridgetown, Barbados, where the inaugural edition of the Afro-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum 2022 is holding with the theme, One People, One Destiny, Uniting and Reimagining Our Future. Delegates from over 90 countries of the world, with 50 from the African continent, arrived to be part of the event.
the country president arrives as scheduled for the commencement of the program. Nigeria's poet Dike Chukumerije sets the tone for the session. Chosen instead to reincarnate here in the Caribbean as Calypso. The need to deepen partnership, strengthen strategic and business relationship, build linkages between the two regions, top the day's discussion. We are living in a period of global economic uncertainty and geopolitical upheaval. The result is that peoples of the South, including Africa and the Caribbean, are often caught in the middle with real life negative consequences. Consider that in 2018, total CARICOM exports to the rest of the world amounted to 18.6 billion US, with total exports to Africa of only 815 million US. CARICOM exports to Africa represented, therefore, 4.4% of its exports totally. In that same year, CARICOM imports from the world stood at 33 billion US with imports from Africa of only 603 million US. In his submission, the President and Chairman, Board of Africa and Bank, Professor Benedict Orama says, both regions must forge a common front to harness several opportunities available, including the $27 trillion North American markets. We will want to live here with actionable proposals on how to open air and sea links between the Caribbean and Africa. To share knowledge and jointly invest in climate adaptation projects and to create institutional arrangements that will enable capacity building and greater daily engagements amongst ourselves, including more Africa-Caribbean marriages so that the links we are rebuilding will be unbreakable. While history may have been unkind to the people of both regions with tales of slavery written in blood, the future awaits to be penned down in gold with the right course of action taken. We, the children of independence, have determined that we shall not allow another generation to pass without bringing together that which should never have been torn asunder. It's just the one of the conference and it's been fireworks from the beginning. Questions have been asked, drafts have been plotted, compass has been designed that would help the continent or both region explore the vast, the huge resources available to them. From Bridgetown in Barbados, Chris Lems, Channels Television News. That's it. Uh, Chris is still there and uh, the Ring Business Incorporated uh, will have another conversation with him to bring us up to date on that summit going on in Barbados. And now let's uh, look inwards now and uh, have a conversation on supply chain management. Uh, it continues to gain popularity globally, not just in Nigeria. More people than before acquiring knowledge in this area. If you check online, you see a lot of supply chain uh, courses made available. So we decided to look at one of our sectors, major sectors, agriculture, agricultural, agricultural sector in Nigeria and uh, examine the supply chain management in that area. And to help us do that uh, is uh, Mr. Tunde Banjoko of Banjoko Motunde Farms. Now, uh, he's uh, directly involved in, his, uh, in it and uh, should be in a good position. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Banjiko. Thank you so Thank much you, for good joining morning. us. And a beautiful studio, I must comment. Thank this you so much. New, new <laughs> okay. Yeah, good to have you in a new studio. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the issue of supply chain management has become very sophisticated yeah. in recent times. Uh, the more complex the world gets, the oh. more technology, the more demands the more products, the more complicated the supply chain. Yeah. But let's, let's dovetail into our own agricultural sector. Sure. Do we have an organized supply chain? Uh, no, no, or everybody don't. do what you like no, or no. what you know we, how to we, do? We don't at the moment. It's still a disorganized sector. And uh, one of the 
project the agric industry said they were going to work on this is to have a private led agro commodity kind of but i'm not sure that is being enforced at the moment and i think we can actually look because we've not done anything about it that is actually one of the reasons i personally believe we are where we are today in terms of the rising food prices you know looking at uh, the consumer price index, for example, Agric is doing food, is doing about 65%. That's why the inflation keeps going up. And you look at what we've been doing, even as a government, as individuals, we are not doing so much. If I could give maybe one or two indicators to that, we have as a, as a nation, we have a storage capacity of about 1,050,000 capacity for storage, but we are using just about 27% of it, about 261,000. So meaning, bulk of what we are producing, we are not storing. And in 2020, we look at the value of our post-harvest losses, for example. Yeah, I think that's about 50%. 3.5 trillion was wasted. The value of food that didn't get to the table. And yet, we do so, say we do not have enough so, food. So, so you ask yourself, why are food expenses? Is that we don't have enough or we are not managing? So that's why supply chain is very important. Because if we can say, we've not gotten the figure for 2021, the value. So if only 2020, one year, we are talking of 3.5 trillion, it tells me that if we do the figure for the last five years, I'm sure it might be in the range of over 10 trillion that has been wasted. And it's something we can always see. You know, like I always say, wasted, you drive down. Especially when you travel Nigeria and you are not just flying, flying, driving down, you, you get to some state, you see foods wasting away, not even getting to the next community. Mm. So I, I, can, I can tell you that <laughs> firsthand because I remember when I did a trip between some states in the northern yeah. part of Nigeria, you go yeah. maybe from Kaduna to Kano yeah. to Bochi, just along the road, you Those. see a lot of tomatoes and pepper just, you know, wasting, wasting away. away. You know, some are trying to preserve it locally, so they just spread it out there. But yeah. eventually, nothing comes so, out so, so of it. It's really a big industry. And when you look at the value that has been put on that, it's over $200 million. That industry alone, not even production, that if we can organize... Not even the value chain. Just organizing ourselves. What people can make in between the production and the table. It's over $200 million. And then that even 2 million people in Nigeria can get involved. Because when you look at what are we talking about really, is this thing has been produced. About 90% of what we consume is from the small other farmers, 80% of them. So meaning the large players are really not the one feeding us, it's the small players when they are aggregated. So when these people produce and it can't get to us, we are in trouble. And that's what we are suffering now as a nation. Because uh, supply chain involves, we talk about where it's being produced, how is, be, is it being moved, how is it being processed, how is it getting to the table, and then it has to also get to the table in a sustainable way. So in meaning, good quality. So it has to be sustainable. So, and if we are not paying attention to that, we might still be going through what we are going through as a nation. So is this just about the issue of infrastructure or is it a matter of just putting on our thinking t uh, caps and putting the logistics in place? Of course, it has to start with the thinking. Um, for example, if I could mention, Lagos State did something about a week ago in Ekwe, having an hub for storage and to ease logistics of moving food into Lagos. That's one thing that is very laudable, and it's one of the things we should be thinking of. I think Professor Pato told me and some other guys Yeah, well, I mean, Lagos State did it. How impactful is it now? You no, know, they just started. It's not, okay. we're not going to have the effect of it today. No, no, no. But it's what every state should be thinking of, that how do we keep, preserve what is being produced in such a way that instead of people just wasting this thing away, we can keep them for when it is not in season. Like I proposed something in, I think, 2016 to BOI that we can preserve plantain for six months in such a way that when it is in season, you keep them. Because that's what value chain is all about. It means when it is in season, it's always in volume. You always have demand, I mean, supply exceeding demand. So supply chain tells us when these things are exceeding our demand, what are we doing with the excess? We should keep them in such a way that we can have them sustainable. All year round, the cons I mean, the consumers are being thought of in the process. But if we are not doing that, 
then we keep having these issues of when mango is in excess, you have this, when cassava price will keep going up, nobody's regulating. But as long as people start coming into the value chain, into the supply chain, the real proper supply chain, starting with the thinking of what can we do? Because we are not having, yes, we have issues of production, but if we, with what we are producing, can put a proper structure, starting with warehousing, some product can be warehouse. Gary, for example, people warehouse for six months fresh. There's a way you pack them. So when you have Gary, in, I mean, in high supply, what do we do with them? Keep them. Either government or private individuals can do. Or palm oil, do people do that? They keep them when they're in high, like we are just ending the session for palm oil now. People will keep them October, November, December, they'll sell at a higher price. But if the government and some individuals are more involved, will not be seen at a higher price during those period. What we'll just be seeing is we'll still be having regular supplies of all those products. So we should start thinking both government, individual. Like I said, I don't know the state of what Pastor Tommy is doing in uh, those states now because they started one as well. I don't know how far they've gone. But if we start having such ops in different geopolitical zones, in different states, I think we'll have a structure. And then there's money to be made, really. Yeah, so there's money to I be wanted made. to ask, <laughs> it sounds more like business opportunity for private, uh, private sector. Sincerely, it's a good area. We should, we, I'm a farmer, for example. We don't all have to hope, go to the farm. What they can do is, what we have produced, can somebody find a way to move them from where they've been produced to where they are needed? Can somebody provide storage? For example, there are modern storage facilities for grains. Can somebody invest in them? I know somebody is doing one in Joss, and I think he did one in Akure as well, where you can keep grains, cocoa, things like that for a longer period. So those are the things we should be thinking of. So there's money to be made, really. And we need the government and the private, because really what I'm more concerned about this is if we are not keeping and storing them, then we are going to discourage those that are producing because the price will be crashing on them. Hmm. Because and then we'll continue having this post-harvest so losses. So people will start, like we've witnessed in 2022, a lot of people are just saying, even the one we produced, the price are not good. So they are not even motivated to produce more. And the more people are stopping in that area of production, the prices will be going up in the market. And now we're talking about how to attract, especially the youth, into the agriculture sector. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, th I think the youth of these days, they're they are, they are in a hurry. They are in they're not so patient. <laughs> so, no, no, so if there's no ready market <laughs> and there's no um, a chain that would offtake it, from of them. course, starting from having a mechanized farming to yeah. start with, then uh, so, I don't know how we can attract so, the so, fresh so, blood. So, so once you know that, okay, once I produce, even though if I don't have a ready-made of taker, there's a government institution or there's, I mean, a private entity that will mop up this volume at this minimum price. If I could use some, if I'm allowed, you know, for example, you look at the price of cassava in the market, for those of us that are supply industries, it has really crashed. Let me tell you the truth. Most people are saying, I'll wait a little. I won't have it now. Because when you look at the numbers with what you imputed, it's not justified. So let me say, I'll keep paying my staff, keep maintaining my farm. Let me see what the price will look like in two months because nobody wants to run at a loss because the funds are also not cheap that we are using. So to encourage youth and anybody coming, we must have people mopping it up. We must have people going into processing. We must have people providing cold storage for moving products that requires cold storage. So those are, it's, a, it's really an opportunity for us to make more money. Yeah, in well, Nigeria. I think you just hit the nail on the head. <laughs> uh, I think our viewers have to know that there's money to be made, actually, yeah. if you follow the agricultural supply chain. So please, we do need more investors in the agricultural we sector need. to feed the nation, feed yeah. Nigeria. We don't need to have uh, food insecurity if you put your money in the agricultural sector. Yeah, I yeah. guess I have to say that because we all eat. No, and that's the first. All, that's the first need of that's man. That's the first need, mm -hmm. and then because of where we also have found ourselves, uh, and it's also sustainable. You know, when people, when investors are thinking, they are thinking of: Is this scalable? Is this sustainable? This is scalable. It's sustainable. It's sustainable. And there's the market. You know, mm -hmm. when we talk about Nigeria population is 206 million, meaning we have the market. Yes. And you know, I was also looking in the past few days, looking at even our exports. 
there's also the opportunity for us. To if export, we have we follow that some of chain. these things, we look, I think we exported 1.7 trillion in the last four years. And we imported about three point, maybe three point eight <laughs> trillion. Don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, meaning if we manage very well, yeah. we'll have enough, both for we local can deal production with account deficits. and then we can yeah. also Thank have you so for much, export. Mr. Thank Tony you, Banjoko, Chief Executive Officer of Banjoko Motley Farms, and uh, we do hope this message goes round and Nigerians to bring money into the we supply chain, <laughs> and then we'll have more. Thank you for having me. All right, so we'll take a break now. After the break, African creative markets will be in focus. If you're interested in the creatives, that will be your conversation. Join us after the break. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. Welcome back. We're still watching Business Morning here on Channels Television. Well, the Africa Creative Market is organized by the United States Consulate in collaboration with members of the creatives in Nigeria. The founder of that market, uh, Inye Lawao, an alumna of the Fortune U.S. Department of State's Global Women's Monetary Mentoring Partnership Program, and also the founder of the African Creative Market, joins us now to tell us more about that. Hi, Inye, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. On this. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Yeah. I know you had to take time off. Uh, I think the event is still on ends tomorrow. How's it been? How's the response been? It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. I mean, um, I, I think it's an answer to some of the problems we've had over time within the creative um, um, industry. So everyone is really responsive. Um, they've been responsive. We've, we've had so many people come through from the time it started up until now. And our schedule is usually long per day. So we start at nine in the morning and end around 10. But people stay from the beginning to the end. So it's very encouraging. And um, we're also so um, happy that you know people are responding to it this way. Okay, so you're having talks. Uh, I know you have trainings and stuff like that. Tell us a bit about uh, some of those things you're doing. Yes. Yeah, so the idea of creating the platform is to um, put together value exchange um, conversations that we could have between the local and create and, and international stakeholders. And um, we have a delegation from different parts of the world um, or several delegations from different parts of the world who have come into Nigeria um, to have this conversation. We're not just having conversations this time around, but we're looking for sustainable solutions um, for the creative um, industry and also to build the creative economy here. And um, so far, I mean, I don't know if you you know the numbers, but the um, the global creative sector is a is a six trillion dollar economy, and Africa is only contributing one point four percent of that. So that shows you how untapped um, the creative um, um, industry is, and how and what potential um, we have, and how big it it can be. So the idea is let's have people who have done this sustainably over time, people who have built several structures that help them, that has helped them um, to grow their industry, let's have them here and have conversations with them and see how we can use some of the knowledge we gain from them to build ours. And it's been awesome so far. So access to funding, masterclasses, trainings, and this year we're focusing on um, music, fashion, film, of course, and dance. And um, we have several partners who have come in, you know, to sort of add value to the process of getting this done. Yeah, well, uh, uh, just as, as you said, I mean, uh, as for other areas also, Nigeria does have a lot of potential. The issue has been, you know, getting into it, getting it out, exploring it. And I guess that's why the U.S. Consul is interested in exploring sustainable business models. So since we're not able to be there, can you share with us some of those models that we can expect to make this change, you know, that, and, mm -hmm. and explore the potential so we don't just remain at the, at the stage of potentials? Yeah, so I think I'll just go straight to treaties. Um, we've had several conversations um, over the years within the creative industry, um, talking to the government and seeing how we can set, um, you know, some of these 
value added um, um, structures between ourselves and other countries. I'll use film as example. Um, so the the representatives from the UK are saying they have um, you know treaties with other countries and they would like to have treaties with you know with Nigeria and more countries as as well um, within Africa. Um, so yes, treaties right now is a major focus to see how if we're bringing someone someone from the UK coming to film in Nigeria, their incentives for them to come because people go to countries where their incentives in that way. So we're having those conversations, but then before we get to the point where this is done, we also as creatives need to understand the process of putting that together. Um, we need to understand how it works uh, because a lot of people don't really understand how that works. We need to break it down through the masterclasses, these this, um, conversations are happening. But at the same time, um, there's the business angle to it as well. We are scaling up on the business knowledge for the creative industry be because before anything can happen, before we can move anything forward, we need to know what we're doing and see this as a business that is sustainable, um, a business that can scale and a business that can scale really fast as well. Hmm. But I do know that this is a lot to assimilate in, uh, I think, three days, four days. It ends tomorrow. Uh, is it's there six way? days, actually. Oh, six days. Great. Uh, <laughs> so is that a sustaining plan, you know, to, to, keep it at, to keep people at it and ensure that, oh, we see the result of what we've talked about? So it doesn't just end, you know, with, with the talks. Yes, we're absolutely result driven. And, um, you know, from the onset, we had said we're tired of having conversations because that's what we've done so far. Have conversations and this talks and workshops and nothing really um, happens. So even in the planning of it, we had looked at certain people we had conversations with locally and spoke to our international partners to to communicate what the needs are for some of the people who are participating locally. So all that has been communicated and there are results happening already. There are results happening already. There are collaborations you know, happening already. We have um, the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They funded a pro program called Thrive. And what we've done is to take um, some women in the, film, um, in the film industry and pair them with um, Hollywood execs. And they're having the mentoring session right now. They, the Hollywood execs were here. They all flew down, all 25 um, you know, of them flew down and had physical you know, exchanges. But now it would go virtually because they've left. Um, they left yesterday, so the rest of it will happen virtually, but then there are talks that are going on. Also, we had a writing pitch competition um, for screenwriters, and um, two of the writers here have won um, a thousand pounds each, and also they've won a mentoring um, mentoring deal with um, one of the stakeholders in the UK um, um, film industry to mentor them through the process of getting their their their, their um, scripts to the point where it's made into into a film. So all of that is going on. We had um, a, the two time um, um, Emmy Award winner Biola Matteson who flew down um, as well from the US and had a photography session, and now he's getting deals for the local photographers here. And the conversations are still ongoing. In fact. All of the people who have come together, whether it's from Brazil, um, you know, or from Greece or from Germany or from the U.S. or from the U.K., are talking about how they can put something together that would help the, the, the industry here, you know, to help facilitate this growth that we're looking for. So, again, we're not doing a copy and paste. The idea is not to take um, their structures and put it here into ours because it won't work. The idea is to find what works for us, but then looking at the structures that they've built in a way to guide us to find what works for us here. Yeah, I really like that. I really like that because a lot of times it seems uh, the emerging economies actually just look at the Western world without considering, you know, the, the, the customized factors of each country mm -hmm. and then just decide to paste. But a lot of people would not be happy with you, Inia, because I don't think you did. A, you made a lot of noise about this, so you would have had more participation. We, we tried our best. Um, and now we have a whole year to plan. Right. Um, it's I would say this is the this is typically what happens with the inaugural year of any program where many people would say I didn't hear about it. But thank you for having me on channels. <laughs> 
thanks to you, a lot of people are watching and are hearing about it. And I'm saying this will happen every year. Um, this will happen every year from now, and we will make more noise. In fact, by October, we're announcing our dates for next year, and everyone will get to know when we're doing it next year so we can have more people um, as well. We had a lot of people who heard about it, but then a lot of people have complained um, that they didn't hear about it. But mm. I can assure you, I can assure everyone watching, we'll come back to channels if you can promise you bring us back to talk about our dates for next year so more people more people will hear about it okay yeah i i know this is uh you're doing this in collaboration of course with the united states uh consulate Absolutely. is the government involved Yes, um, in fact, um, we had NIDAC this year in, in participation, um, and we had the DG of NIDAC come here to talk about the importance of integrating tech into the creative industry. So yes, there are government organizations that are involved. We also have our patron, who is the, the owner of IFE. He is coming from a cultural angle, you know, as well, to give us the support that we need. And he's done a lot to introduce us to different agencies um, as well. We have have a few um, agencies, government agencies that we reached out to. Again, we will reach out, we'll take this conversation, um, you know, to a greater level to involve more of the government organizations. But this year's focus was really to get the creatives together for us to, first of all, understand the importance of the business, focusing on the business of the creative industry. And then we can start involving the major stakeholders, you know, here who can help us take it to the next level. Because what has happened over time is sometimes some of this um, um, interventions are created um, by the government, but then a lot of the creatives are not able to assess it. Some it's due to lack of knowledge, um, due to lack of training in the, you know, in the aspect of, you um, getting those opportunities, you know, for themselves. But what we've done now is to facilitate the training, start up the conversation, and we're not just going to wait for one year before, you know, we start we start having this conversation again. We're going to continue with our trainings that would happen virtually, sometimes in person, so that by next year when we're doing the next one, we're really ready. We want to sign deals on the spot. Some deals are being signed on the spot right now, but we want to sign more on the spot by next year. All right, uh, Inye Lawal, founder of African Creative Market. Thank you so much, and we wish you the very best. You want the creative uh, industry. We wish, wish you the real best. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, that was Inye Lawal, and uh, the event is still ongoing at the U.S. Consulate here in Lagos. Uh, it's for the creatives, and we do hope to explore everything that we have. That's why we put our eyes on everything. Now let's head to the market where Will Ibong is joining me with a big smile on her face. Any hey, good morning. She won again. She won <laughs> I again. did, I did, I did. Again, I did Chris say, so I did, she won again. I did say the market was going to perform well. Well, it didn't fall short of my expectation. It seems to be actually there ranked goes greedy the fourth, the fourth there goes best greedy performing wheel. equities market in globally. There so goes it has to perform. There goes greedy it, wheel. <laughs> it's greedy wheel all the way. Look, have you looked like the Asian and the U.S. market? Oh, uh, yeah. That's what I'm saying is we are ranked the fourth best performing globally so i don't want to know how other markets are performing <laughs> at the moment but the equities market is doing i'll thing. remind you <laughs> <laughs> bullish sentiments persisted in the local bus yesterday as buying interest in investments oh and do access holdings drove the all share index higher 0.11 percent to 49,899 points the market cap is still at 26.98 trillion naira now Yet a date has moved higher. It's now at 16.8%. We're getting back to possibly the 20% level. The total volume of trade declined yesterday, however. Volume value was down. We saw 229 million units of units traded yesterday. Um, valued at 1.75 million uh, naira, billion naira, and all in 3,500 deals. Sterling Bank was the most traded stock by volume yesterday. It had about 108.7 million units of its shares traded. GTCO, however, was the most traded stock by value at 680.45 million naira. Now, analyzing by sectors, we saw the banking sector was down. Consumer was up. 
industrial was up, insurance, oil and gas was up. Insurance was down with the banking sector. We just know what really drove the, the sentiments for the banking sector and the insurance sector. The financial sector didn't really do so well yesterday. But however, measured by market breakfast or market sentiments was positive. 13 stocks gained uh, against 12 other losers. Pharma Deco topped that, uh, that gain, 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 the gainers chart. Now we have uh, Afalabi Benro. He is a trader at Stambik IBT Stockbrokers to give us more insight as to what's going on in the market. Hello. Uh, Falabi, how are you doing this morning? Good morning, Will. Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, Falabi, what's currently driving sentiments? You know, the market closed August and opened September in the green. What sentiments are driving this positive performance and can it be sustained? Um, so the, 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 the volumes are just the fact that the volumes are very low um, because, um, I mean, a couple of um, um, some time back, the announcement was made that um, rates were going to be increased. Um, um, so the expectation is that rates are going to be increased on the fixed income instruments. So equities um, is not um, sort of um, the, the favorites for um, a lot of investors now. A lot of investors are being distracted by um, fixed income um, yields currently. So sentiments in the equities markets have been basically driven by um, just um, investors trying to take positions ahead of um, some um, potential dividends which have been announced um, and payments have been made. Um, some are just looking at the prices currently now and seeing that these are really attractive levels and are trying to take advantage for the long term. Um, other investors are just um, just trying to look for the looking for where the money is, um, to be honest. So that's, that's what's going on in the market, and that's, that's what's driving sentiments. So what are the opening calls uh, this morning? What are you seeing? What are the numbers? Um, so it's still, it's still another quiet morning. Um, we've seen most of the value traded going through in um, MTN. We've seen about 2.3 million shares traded at um, 199 levels. Um, that's flat versus yesterday. Um, Access Bank is up. 4.12%, uh, um, still on thin volumes. Um, Zenit Bank is also up 0.94%, um, also on thin volumes. We're also seeing UBA and Fidelity up. So right now, it's looking like the banks are the ones that are driving uh, sort of activities in the market now. Um, we expect that um, this will probably be the trend. It's Friday, um, end of the week. So um, we're expecting that activities might pick up um, slightly, um, but most likely the banks will be the ones to drive activities again today. I'm talking about bank, banking sector driving the activities. Zenit Bank was down yesterday about 2 point something percent and 0 0.2 something percent. Is, do you think that the Zenit Bank, the banking sector, is going to drive uh, positive sentiment today? And what's the outlook for next week? Uh, well, so it's already seen a little bit of a, of a recovery this morning. It's up 0.94 percent. Uh, most of the um, the losses that were recorded in Zenith were recorded towards the end of the, the trading session yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it looked as if it was just someone that just needed to uh, finish selling what they were selling. Mm -hmm. um, if that person is done, then we'll probably start to see um, an appreciation in, um, in, 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 in the price of the stock today, and which is what we've been seeing so far today. Uh, so what's the outlook for next week? I'm looking for a bullish, bullish week. So what are you saying? Are you bullish for next week? Uh, <laughs> I'd like I'd, I'd, I'd like to say still, well, um, indications so far uh, still look as though uh, we might still see um, sort of like a quiet um, trend going into next week. Uh, not so bullish um, as you mm. have suggested. Mm. So thank you so much, Afala Big Benro, for your insights on the program. Afala Big Benro, trader, Stanbic IBT stock brokers. So thank you. any we're seeing what we're seeing in the market. Any SD do oh, gave a downtrend yesterday. <laughs> surprise drop. Well, not Don't a surprise worry. drop. Don't Maybe worry. much expected. We'll be back. We're, we'll be uh, back. we're back at one trillion uh, naira and uh, several sixty-two points. I'm just hoping there was also volume value was also down yesterday. Um, it was just a down downer for the NES, the unlisted market, equities market was, didn't really perform well, well yesterday. Well, it, it, there has to be a balance somewhere. There Just has as to be. your guest, uh, Falabi said, <laughs> yeah. uh, with the yields going up, you have investors looking the way of fixed income, income at the moment. and not looking at uh, equities yeah. uh, that much. Mm. So let's not get our hopes so high because mm. it's still a bearish mm, market. My fingers always cross for the equities <laughs> market. <laughs> 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 always cross. <laughs> 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 All right, Will. Thank you so much for uh, that uh, details from the market. We'll be back tomorrow, apart from today at uh, 1.30. We will be back at 1.30. Uh,
7 p.m. tomorrow for Capital Market. So every information you think you missed when it comes to the markets, Cap uh, Capital Market will be here with Will Ibong to give you uh, everything that happened during the week. Let's take a break now because uh, our correspondent in London is waiting. She has a lot of stories for us. Uh, that'll be after the break. This is Business Morning on Channel 7. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning here on Channel Television. We head to London now with Juliana, correspondent. Good morning, Juliana. Well, um, Juliana, 120 million pounds is uh, what was tagged on the festival of Brexit, but it fell below expectations. Is this is, are people just caught up with the year of the squeeze? I think, uh, good morning, by the way, Innie. I think not only are people caught up with the year of the squeeze, I don't think many people have heard of it, which is why um, Unboxed, which is what this Brexit festival was, celebration of Britain after Brexit festival um, has been called, um, has not done so well because there have been so many activities. We talk about the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, um, the Lionesses' victory in Wembley, the Birmingham Commonwealth J Games in July. Um, Nobody had time uh, to attend this festival. As you said, it cost £120 million, a lot of money. Um, if you think that people are going through a cost of living uh, crisis at the moment, it was first heralded uh, by a former uh, British Prime Minister, Theresa May, in 2018. She wanted to celebrate uh, Brexit, um, which was a surprise given she was um, a Remainer when um, the vote took place. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it was carried on uh, by Boris Johnson's uh, government, really given uh, the white flag by um, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who was once a, a senior a member of Boris Johnson's uh, cabinet. But they've looked at the numbers uh, since March, since it's been going around the country. I believe uh, there were several events supposed to take around, um, take place around the country, 10 events. Um, it was supposed to attract 66 million um, uh, 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 spect spectators. It's only managed um, to sell tickets to about a quarter of a million people, not what um, was meant uh, to take place. And now it has been called an absolute failure. According to uh, the former Brexit minister, it's been um, hijacked by anti-Brexiteers and the woke mob or the so-called woke mob, uh, which is uh, people that push some would say controversial views, some would say right views, uh, such as gender fluidity, he, the, they, them, which is very much accepted um, <laughs> in, a, in this country, uh, but perhaps not accepted by um, the audience members because they've just failed um, to show up. So a bit of an um, egg in the face as uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson finally bows out um, this week. Well, officially he bows out on Tuesday. His successor will be announced on Monday. Day. Uh, but yet again, uh, Brexit nightmares uh, continue to taunt him. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, the economy continues to feel the impacts of Brexit. Seems a lot of areas have not been sealed. You know, uh, they might just end this uh, festival, Juliana. But let's look at Microsoft now. They're facing a probe. What's that about? Yeah, you're absolutely right. If we cast our minds back to January, Microsoft, the trillion dollar uh, company, um, tried to complete its biggest acquisition yet. And this was of Activision Blizzard. Um, they are the umbrella company that own really popular games uh, like Call of Duty. Um, if you're not um, a Call of Duty fan, perhaps you'll know Candy Crush, which was a massive game um, a, a few years ago. In fact, anytime I'm very, very bored, I do uh, try to uh, complete another level of Candy Crush. Uh, but the CMA, uh, the Competition and Markets Regulator um, here in uh, the UK, um, say that they're not really um, happy about um, this uh, merger. Uh, they believe already Microsoft, as well as Sony and others, already dominate um, the console sector. But then Microsoft have um, the upper edge because, of course, we know that they are um, a, a titan when it comes to cloud operating systems. And they do believe, because of the 400 million 
uh, gamers that use Activision uh, Blizzard's games, um, it's just not going to be fair for the competition, um, for their competitors. Uh, so what they're asking for is by, I believe, September the 8th, uh, for Activision Blizzard and Microsoft to address some of their concerns. Um, they have addressed them publicly. They say this is going to be uh, great for users and that it's going to expand Microsoft's gaming um, uh, opportunities. Uh, but nevertheless, they want a written statement prepared for them by next week. If that's not done, then it goes into phase two, and then we'll just have to wait and see uh, where um, this um, a probe goes. Yeah, well, we wish them the best, uh, but of course we wish uh, the people, the consumers, uh, the better of, of it. Thank you so much, uh, Juliana. We'll talk to you at 1.30. Talk to you then. All right, so let's uh, move to the other market now, the one that normally uh, closes the program, and that's the crypto market. Uh, looking at, of course, beginning with the fair grade index for this morning. Is it better than yesterday? Yes or no? Let's have it on the board. We do know that yesterday, uh, that uh, the numbers were at 20. That means that... Uh, it is better than yesterday, but uh, I don't think we do have a whole lot to celebrate because we are still at extreme fear. That's the market sentiment there. That means investors are still not very happy at this time. 25 there. So let's look at uh, the numbers. Uh, market cap for uh, this morning at about 8 a.m. there, um, 984, almost 1% up, but of course not to 1%, 984.55 billion dollars, 24-hour volume. 62.34 billion, uh, that's reduced. BTC dominance also reduced yesterday. It, was, uh, it had gained more than this, but today it's uh, down 0.22%. Uh, let's see the price of, or oh, no, the top alt by market cap. If we could have that, there you go. BNB, ADA, uh, yesterday we had a whole lot of, uh, I think yesterday the only green we had was the e-cash, but today the reverse is the case. A BNB is up 0.04%, uh, ADA also, Niger one of Nigeria's favorite, is up 2.19%, while e-cash uh, seems to have, uh, I don't know, trying to find their stance. So it's now down more than less, more than 2%, almost 2.5% XRP is also up 2.41%. Uh, BNB was actually negative yesterday. Yeah, we had a whole lot of that. So let's see the price of Bitcoin. Uh, this is as at 8 a.m. today. Uh, I know somewhere in the night, I was just checking through and I saw that Bitcoin actually went to 19,000. But uh, thankfully, just before uh, dawn, it's back to 20,000. 0.35% up, and then 24-hour volume is 29.38 billion. If we could see the price of Ethereum, there you go. Also doing well this morning, 2.24% at 1,586. 24-hour volume, 16.04. We have Michael Nadji now joining us uh, to tell us what's going on in the market. Hi, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Thanks yeah. for having me. Good to have you, Michael. What's going on in the market? Uh, one day, I mean, when we looked at the top alts by market cap, one day we had four of them in the red and e-cash alone in the green, and then the next day is the reverse. What's going on? What are the drivers at this time? Uh, so, yeah, we had the uh, job numbers come out from the U.S. yesterday, and so basically what you had was you still had uh, a raging job market. You still have, uh, you know, job openings in the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, at the growth rate is something that we've never seen before, and so this will still force the Fed to end up having to keep on tightening and keep on trying to break the labor market. Um, so the Fed has to keep going. So what that means for Bitcoin, uh, it means the pain is about to the, the pain is about to hit. You know, it's about to hit. I think we have 30 to 45 days from finding a real bottom. I think we end up somewhere closer in the teens for Bitcoin. Um, but I think this 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 level we're testing at 20,000. I think ultimately it breaks down. I think this is one of the last times we see it above 20,000 for, for, like, for a while. Um, so I think going forward, I think, you know, the number where it wants to go at is in the mid-teens for Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. so I think finally this weekend, we might just lose this level. 
Um, but you know, the downside is, is going to be here. Um, it's, it's, it's still coming. Uh, I don't think we rally anytime soon, but I do think in the next 30 to 45 days, we do put in a two to three year bottom um, that we just never go below again. I think you know, if you're a long-term buyer or trying to actually buy and hold Bitcoin for a longer term, I think in the next 30 to 40 days, uh, you will have opportunities that, you know, resemble the buying Bitcoin at $3,000 in the last cycle. Michael, I think don't that... break our heart, Michael. How <laughs> can you put Bitcoin at $3,000? That's going to no, break... No, no. No, it's not going to 3000 It's As I said, basically, if Bitcoin goes to 14000 it's okay. going to be the same as going to 3000 okay. the last cycle. <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, so that level is, uh, I think it's a long, it's a longer term buying opportunity. Some people like to quote it as a generational bottom. I mm. think, you know, buying Bitcoin at, at you know, at uh, fourteen or 16000 represents that same generational bottom people right. bought at 3000 So, yeah, that's something we got to look for in the next 30 to 45 days. And once that comes, that's going to be the last one for the next two to three years. So people have to be ready because the pain's about to come. And once it's done, it's that's going to be it. All right, Michael. Uh, well, <laughs> we'll just take your word and, and hope for the best, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. All right, uh, we do have uh, the top gainers there. You have there. Uh, we have the Celsius, US, CUS, and uh, Chile's there. We see double digit gains there. Good one. And then the top losers, just before we go, the top losers were uh, Leo. We had Leo. We have Synthetic. We have Helium. And then we had Nexo and eCash. eCash has gone to the top losers for the day. What a way to close the week. It's been an interesting one having you here uh, with us. Uh, but we'll start another round on Monday. So don't miss it, 10 a.m. We're always here to give you information from the world of business. I'm in John McQuarrie. Remember, at 1.30, Business Incorporated will be here. And tomorrow, 7 p.m., Capital Market will also be here. Enjoy your weekend. I'm in John McQuarrie.